very warm welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Axel Threlfall, I'm editor at large for Reuters based out of London and I am thrilled to be involved once again with the International Transport Forum, albeit minus uh, the hustle and bustle of the conference centre uh, in Leipzig. Uh, our aim in this session is hinted at strongly in its title. It is a session focused on action, how to achieve sustainable equitable mobility given the increasingly complex context uh, in which we're operating, which uh, includes, of course, uh, understanding the long-term impacts of the pandemic uh, on the transport system. So uh, today we want to discuss ways uh, to act decisively on the advice outlined in yesterday's Outlook report taking into consideration the rapidly shifting context. What is crystal clear is that current transport decarbonization policies are far from enough uh, to get us to where we need to be. So finding ways to fast track that decarbonization must be a priority, be it a focus uh, on behavioral change or effectively harnessing stimulus packages for economic recovery from the pandemic. So plenty to talk about. In a moment, uh, we'll get a bit more detail uh, on what yesterday's outlook outlined as the main uh, issues that still need to address. After that, I'll introduce uh, a super panel we have uh, lined up for you to throw all of these issues around. But first, uh, let me give the floor to the Secretary General of the ITF, Young Tai Kim, for his opening remarks. Over to you. Dear colleagues, it's a great pleasure to open this panel session as part of the ITF Summit, and more specifically as part of the full day dedicated to the new ITF Transport Outlook 2021. This panel is looking at how we can move from advice to action, how we can make a transition to sustainable, equitable mobility. We at the ITF consider the Transport Outlook as a strategic tool it helps us to analyze how world could change if we choose different policies and development paths. It helps us to identify policy actions to reach our vision for transport future, economically, socially, and environmentally sustainable transport. The outlook presents long-term projection for transport demand and related CO2 emissions under alternative policy scenarios. These scenarios are based on ITF's in-house models covering all modes of transport, freight and passenger, globally, nationally, and at city level. The COVID-19 pandemic has dramatically affected our daily lives and challenged the way we work, travel, and live. This edition of our look has a specific focus on the impacts of COVID-19 on transport, providing answers to that question. But more importantly, it identifies pathways to achieve the climate goals of the Paris Agreement within reach, faster, and with more certainty. It also identifies policies that are needed to support the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, policies that will tackle both decarbonization and inequality. The policy scenarios presented in this report are designed to explore possible futures and to understand what role public policy can play in building the future transport system. Given the uncertainties and complexities of these assumptions, scenarios should not be seen as forecast for the next 30 years. They are rather scenarios to understand what role public policy can play in conceptualizing the future transport system. So for us at the ITF, the transport outlook is a discussion starter. It is also a call for action to reshape mobility. My colleague, Yari Kaupla, will present key findings of the outlook, and I hope this will provide the panel with insight to start the discussion. And more importantly, help to move from advice to action. I'm very much looking forward to hearing from our great panel how this transition can be done. Thank you very much. Axel, you are muted. 
um, um, apologies. I was uh, muted, uh, and I'm just going to say that again. Yantai, thank you very much indeed for that. We're going to get a little bit more insight uh, into the report. Uh, I'd like to give the floor now to uh, Yari Kaupila, uh, head of the ITF uh, Secretary General's Office, who's going to run us through some of the uh, high-level findings. Yari, over to you. Thank you, Axel. It is really a great pleasure to introduce the new ITF Transport Outlook 2021. As many may have already seen key highlights during earlier sessions, I will very briefly summarize some of the key findings from the new edition to provide a starting point for the discussions of the panel, as our Secretary General mentioned earlier. So what are the key facts coming from the ITF Transport Outlook? First, global demand for transport will more than double by 2050, both for freight and passenger transport. This is quite much a lower projection from our previous outlook 2019, which reflects partly the new policy commitments that countries have put in place since 2019, but also less optimistic economic projections, even before COVID-19. COVID-19 pandemic brought transport demand to a halt, but only temporarily. We see traffic already at pre-pandemic levels. Population and economic growth, especially in emerging economies, will drive growth in demand. This means, as you see in this slide, that even if all announced climate policies are put in place, CO2 emissions will grow by 16% by 2050. Any progress towards low carbon mobility is more than offset by the increased demand for mobility. This means overshooting the goal of limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius by three times. Current decarbonization policies are simply not ambitious enough to meet climate goals. We see a strong correlation between regions that generate the highest per capita GDP and the individual CO2 footprint. But the good news is that these are also the world regions with the capital and technological means to take a leading role in reducing emissions. However, more ambitious decarbonization policies together with well-targeted economic stimulus packages would bring the climate goals within reach faster and with more certainty. Ambitious policies could cut transport CO2 emission by 70% by 2050. So to arrive at that future, we identify six top priorities for policymakers. First off, we need to raise ambition to reverse CO2 emission growth. The revision of the nationally determined contributions offers an opportunity to set ambitious targets and identify clear actions for the transport sector. We have identified a pathway that allows to meet carbon targets, and that is our reshape scenario. If we further front load and leverage opportunities during the pandemic recovery, we can meet these objectives sooner and with more certainty. That is why we need to align policies to revive the economy, combat climate change, and strengthen social cohesion of our societies. Global inequality has increased in many areas. First, income distribution has increased. Uh, we see middle class shrinking in our societies. CO2 emissions are also unequally distributed with low income countries often suffering the most of the climate consequences. In transport itself, many vulnerable groups have worse access to opportunities, such, such as jobs, schools, or healthcare than those who are better off. This is a result of poor transport system in many countries. And COVID-19 pandemic has really further aggravated this situation. So aligning policies for decarbonization, economic recovery, and inclusion will be more cost-effective 
it will gain better public support and will help us to achieve our goals faster. One of the most important ways to align these goals is to move from mobility-focused policies to those that focus on accessibility. Accessibility-focused policies center on people having access to opportunities without putting so much emphasis on traveling more or traveling faster. This will enable users to choose the most effective mode or route for the purpose of trips or for the movement of goods, which focus on sharing of assets, both in passenger and freight. Each sector needs, however, specific strategies. Urban transport has the greatest potential for decarbonization through electrification, shorter travel distances, and availability of non-motorized options and availability of public transport. For long distance passenger transport, solutions can be different. For example, alternative aviation fuels are crucial where no alternative mode for travel exists. For freight transport, low carbon technologies will need to be boosted together with scaling up of already existing measures such as digitalization, standardization, and consolidation. When we talk about technology, we do not yet have all the breakthroughs we will need to decarbonize the sector. Therefore, it is extremely important we need to invest in developing new fuels, new vehicles that are affordable and also available quickly. We will also need to encourage the adoption of these new solutions by providing financial incentives and invest again, for example, in public charging infrastructure. It is important to target first uh, high use vehicle fleets. These are delivery vehicles, buses, shared mobility services. This way we can really reap the most benefit compared to private cars. Finally, one should talk about optimizing the use of existing assets. That is really critical, making the best use of the assets we already have available today. But transport sector cannot succeed alone. We do need collaboration between all sectors. Electric cars will only be emission-free if the electricity production is emission-free. On the other hand, tourism and trade can only become sustainable with sustainable transport. So we are all in this together. We must break silos and also work together. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much, Yari, for that. So um, plenty uh, on the table to discuss there. Let's get on to the action part. As I said, we have a, a super panel lined up to help us with this. Let me introduce them now. Uh, Dr. Nancy van Dijk is economic advisor at the World Bank. Professor Claude van Houten is president of PIAC. And Dr. Jan Hoffman is a chief trade logistics branch at UNCTAD. Uh, I will kick us off uh, for about 30 minutes or so. Then we will get on to um, your questions. But please um, don't hesitate to start sending those questions through. And I'll see if I can uh, weave those in uh, to the discussion. Right, um, Nancy, if I could kick it off with you. Um, there is clearly a window of opportunity uh, as countries come out of lockdown to, cr to create a better mobility experience, to, to tackle congestion, to tackle pollution. Do you, Nancy, get a sense that government and business are seeing that opportunity and can and will make something happen now? Yes, thank you, Axel. That's a really hard question. There is definitely an opportunity um, now created with um, this uh, recovery package and this huge financing that is coming uh, on the table to actually finance some of those more systemic changes that are really needed in transport. Because to be frank, um, what we have seen during the COVID crisis is is really a mix of changing behavior. Some are going in the right direction, but some others are not. So uh, what we want to make sure is that at the end of the day, what we end up is really 
a systemic change and not only marginal changes. And so from my point of view, I see this, uh, the advent of this financing uh, on the table, but also this greater awareness that we need in transport, more than marginal changes, we need a systemic change is actually something very powerful. We also realized with the COVID crisis that the transport system was actually vulnerable to a number of risks, including as we have seen with the COVID, you know, health risk. And so as transport policy makers, we have now a responsibility to make sure that what is in front of us is an opportunity rather than uh, basically a, 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 a time where you know, we may end up going back to some behavior that we have been trying uh, to, to fight back. Okay, Nancy, in fact, let me just quickly pick up on that. You, you talk about the, the danger of a reversion, uh, people driving more, polluting more, uh, using their own cars more rather, rather than, uh, than, than mass transit. Of the, of the six priorities we just heard Yari lay out, which ones are the most realistic uh, for policy, do you think? Um, I mean, raising the ambition is actually very easy. You can always raise the ambition. Now, the question is, will it lead to action? Um, so from my point of view, where we really, the, the change that will really make a difference in the transport sector is actually happening in the energy sector. From my point of view, unless you have a change on the energy side, you will not see in the transport sector the type of systemic changes that we need. Yep. And if you look at what happened during the COVID crisis, we have seen actually a slowdown on the energy side in terms of you know, renewable investments in, in hydropower, et cetera. Now you have to know that 30% of the energy uh, is coming from the transport sector and 95% of this is fossil fuel. So unless you break that connection mm. between fossil fuel consumption and the transport sector, you will not see the type of systemic changes that you need in the transport sector. Yeah, okay, Nancy, thank you very much indeed. Uh, Claude, let me bring you in here. Um, with your Piac hat on, where, where do you think we will see the, the action now from government, given what's been laid out, given what the challenges are, given uh, the, 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 the pandemic context, where is action most realistic in your mind? You got to unmute yourself, Claude. I, I did the same mistake as you, I sorry. Still do it. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Um, Thank you first for the transport outlook exercise because we need to work together to find the solutions to reach the goal and of course PR Cologne is not going to do that. One aspect I probably perhaps missed is what do users actually do and what do they want in the future and it is important to have a user uh, oriented approach also in the debate. We need to work together there is no doubt about it. We have to address all transport users, also women, men, disabled users, and quoting from ITF, climate action should not make the vulnerable worse off, but aim to enhance social equity. And this is really a very important topic after the pandemic. Because as presented in the report, we know that investment in infrastructure creates jobs and helps boost the economy. And also OECD levels this build back better. So we are not asking for more investments. So we just need to think that all the investments we make are normally calculated for 50 to 100 years. And so it is crucial to take quick responses and quick actions indeed on the energy side and the vehicle side, but we may not forget the long-term perspectives and analysis we need on the level of infrastructure. And we may not forget either what is a real problem in all the countries, all member countries, but also all member countries of ITF, 
infrastructure maintenance. And when I say maintenance, it's not only for roads, because roads and streets are the, 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 the ground for many transport modes, but also we have need uh, infrastructure in all modes. And many of the projects that would fit the timely targeted and temporary criteria best are likely to be infrastructure maintenance projects since they can start relatively quickly. Okay, Claude, thank you very much indeed. And by the way, we'll, we'll come back, we'll circle back to, to some, some of the bigger infrastructure questions uh, as we move on in this discussion. Uh, Jan, um, look, there's a, there's a lot on policymakers and business leaders' plates, public health crises, economic crisis, environmental crisis, all um, um, mixed around as, as we try and find equitable, low emission, resilient solutions uh, to mobility. Um, what do you think governments, governments are finding most difficult in this uh, in this context? I, I, I guess it's another way of asking, you know, what, what, what do you feel are the, the biggest barriers right now? Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Axel, and, and thank you, ITF, for another great uh, transport outlook. Yeah, let, let me focus on the on the freight part. And we don't have fair screen here, but there's a great uh, presentation there. I, I want to draw the attention of the our viewers to figure nine and 10 of the outlook, which is about freight and which really shows where the, which mode moves how much and, and the leading and maritime of, of the volume, but also the uh, road in terms of emissions. So when I look at the, the freight transport, I, I would answer your question, I see three challenges, but also opportunities. Um, first, we really should aim at a multilateral global solution for the international transport, uh, Paris, International Maritime Organization, ICAO because the investor needs clarity and, and these, these ships have the funny characteristics. They go from one country to another and, and you, you really should have multilateral solutions, which also means the industry should promote and be proactive with multilateral solutions. For example, at the IMO, International Maritime Organization, to avoid a patchwork of, of regional and national solutions. Uh, the second one point I would like to make is uh, on, on technologies. And Yari also mentioned that he said many, many technologies we need do not yet exist or something along those lines. And you may have seen in the press, uh, John Kerry was a bit criticized, ridiculed for saying something very similar. Mm. And, and I think it's, he is right. Um, we should be ambitious knowing that, listen carefully, technological progress will never be as slow as today. Is it slow? No, it's fast, but it's going to be even faster. So if we only build our plans and future regulations and emission on existing technologies, we will be lagging behind. Um, so in that sense, uh, what we want to achieve and what is out there and what is already in the drawing board will allow for more ambitious solutions than, than we have. A third quick point on your question, like, and, and that's a challenge, of course, for the policymakers mm -hmm. to, to do this step into the fog into the, the future. But I think we, we have to, and, and past history shows we can. Uh, the third, on the, the COVID uh, background, uh, actually, yes, it was shown in the data also in the outlook how emissions went down during this crisis. Um, but a lot of progress was actually made in terms of digitalization, modernization. We have a lot at UNCTA, a lot of projects demand for our work on single windows, pre-arrival processing, digitalization solution to, to avoid electronic payments, to avoid the, the, the inefficiencies of personal in contact and make it digital. So, so I like to say we have to lock in the progress made during lockdown so that we keep the advances made during COVID, which also help with the, uh, the topic, the, the decarbonization and sustainable mobility. Okay, thank you, Jan. Um, Nancy, I want to come back on the the and and by the way, feel feel free to to to, to jump in. But I, I want to come back on the use of stimulus money to make um, this this transition even speedier. Um, we we we've we've talked <clears throat> talked a lot about uh, leveraging that 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 those finances. Uh, is it being done effectively yet? And where is it being done effectively? 
Yes, so, so it's very early days uh, because packages are coming together, um, you know, in several countries and we certainly um, uh, all agree that even that amount of money will not be sufficient to really deliver the type of systemic changes that we're aiming at now. So leveraging, combining uh, resources from, you know, development banks, from national governments, from private sector will be critical for systemic changes. Now, um, key will be to see where this money is going. And uh, there is a lot of discussion. And of course, each sector is very keen uh, to, to uh, put together some, some recommendations as to what would really make a difference uh, for achieving you know, sustainable mobility, but also the sustainable development goals, um, you know, the Paris climate agreements. So, uh, as I said, from my perspective, uh, for the transport sector, I see that we, we need to make a number of investments in the transport sector, no doubts about that. We need also to invest on the energy side, mm. uh, because that will be critical to really uh, cut on carbon emissions that is very much, uh, you know, consumed at this point uh, by, by the transport sector. Now, there are opportunities, as I mentioned, um, more and more, uh, you know, financiers are talking about coordinations. Yesterday, we had the multilateral development banks um, talking at ITF about greater coordination of financing that is put on the table by MDBs. This is a great move. Coordination is definitely the way forward. Um, but we need also, financing will not be enough. Yep. So we need to look at some of the sectors for which it will be very difficult to actually some, solve some of the trade-offs. For instance, uh, the heavy industry that is releasing a lot of emissions. This is also where most of the jobs are. How do you combine, you know, the objective or how do you reach an objective of, you know, reducing carbon emissions, but at the same time, preserving the employment very important in a period of recovery. So all those questions have to be tackled. Um, Claude, with, again, you know, back to the infrastructure piece, with, with your infrastructure hat on, who, and, and with, bearing in mind what, what Nancy has just said, who, who needs to lead this process, really? Is it, is it government or is it business? Are we seeing enough coordination between uh, or the, the different stakeholders involved? Uh, you're on mute again, Claude. It is a very good question, I apologize, um, because what we defend, and it's a barrier sometimes about cooperation and going further, is the fact that we absolutely need to go on with sharing knowledge between all, public and private sector. We are more perhaps in the public sector within PIAC, but if you don't work all together, you will never find the right solutions. Also, we have to avoid to think in silos. Rail or rail is better than roads. No, it depends for what. So we have to be together, to work together, and not to be negative. All the modes are necessary. Um, about infrastructure, we also need really um, resilience and adaptation to climate change. These are clearly issues now on the table we need, because we all need infrastructure, even if we take decisions about the vehicles. And if you go, to, for example, to the, um, the electricity, electric cars, is a very good solution, but this is a personal opinion. It depends how the electricity is produced, where you tap it. Mm. And that is a topic where we have many discussions, where are we going to have progress in that sense? Um, innovation is not cheap. Um, but innovation is absolutely necessary for all the topics. And innovation, not only digitalization, but many other aspects also on the level of infrastructure, infrastructure survey, sensors, and so on. There are so many topics. I will not pronounce this list, but I think you understand what I mean. Perhaps you want to put another question in that sense. Well, you know, actually, I want to I want to put another question to you, and it, this comes yeah. from an audience member. It was going to be um, one of mine as well. What, what what does the infrastructure of the future look like? Um, and, you know, and 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 
is it is it asphalt uh, or is it data is it technology is it is it connectivity because if it's the latter i imagine the the, the private sector has a has a bigger role to play here clear clear and um, i always i've always said that all innovations are boosted by the industry first second to answer you the be better road is asphalt or concrete we have many examples of good roads in, in belgium in concrete we have also bad examples like in many countries but i mean the, I cannot answer you, that is the best road. It depends on the application. You may not compare a motorway with very heavy traffic and where the motorway often is the only solution compared to a street where you don't, where, where you try not to close the surface, but you hope that the water is still going back to the ground, to the groundwater. It's a crucial topic in more urbanized um, surfaces. We have that problem even more in my country, in Belgium. There is too much concrete or asphalt and not enough water going back to the ground. So I would say with that answer, be careful with saying that's the best. No, it's not the best. And that we need the assistance of many systems, traffic support. Of course, we have to optimize the user infrastructure. But a last example, the bridge of Mio, very well known in the whole world, has been calculated for 120 years uh, to be alive. When the projections have been made about traffic 20 years ago, did they take into account COVID, change of vehicles, change of everything now? Mm -hmm. This is very important to have a good collaboration now between infrastructure and technologies to be sure that we are not building. And um, this morning there was a session somewhere, a bridge, it needs 10 years before you build it after the day you decide we need a bridge. Will the bridge within 10 years be the right one? We don't know. And this is really a tremendous aspect we have to talk about all together. You know, I, 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 now you've brought up bridges, the questions come through on bridges, which, which, are, which I, I have to put to you because of the, the organic nature of this conversation. Will <laughs> sensors and bridges really reduce maintenance costs? Chips fail as well, the, uh, the, uh, yeah. the questioner asks. Well, of course, chips fail also, but we have to go with progress and the industry knows very well, I have been a bridge builder. That's why I know that aspect, you know, and with stay cables, for example. If you can correct the tension in the stray cable, that's not the case. But it's very important to adapt your infrastructure. We need accessibility of all the parts of the infrastructure to be able to change them. If you close everything and then you say it has to hold 100 years, we will never reach the goal. Mm -hmm. Um, Jan, let me bring you back in. Um, you know, I'd like to talk a little bit more about the changes in, in global supply chains, the way trade and transport operates, a again with a view to action. You know, this session is about action, what we're going to see, what kind of changes we need to see. Will increased focus on resilience result in, in nearshoring? Is that, is that the result here? Yeah, there was a lot of... Uh speculation i dare say or a lot of thoughts of logically near shoring uh, sounds like to make sense but it's really more about diversification it's really more about uh, not relying on single sources be they close or nearby or be the national or, or international uh, you recall the recent incident in the suez canal the, the ever given uh, where there was a lot of hype about the black swan event and how dramatic it was. It wasn't that dramatic. The good news about that news was it got shipping and resilience of supply chains into the news. And it also showed, again, those users, providers who had a wider portfolio, both in terms of transport supply, like not only this one route, but maybe also uh, uh, the Trans-Siberian Railway or other routes or go through the Panama Canal, and also in terms of product supply. So I, I'm not really seeing that much. And also in terms of data, I'm not saying it's not going to happen, but we haven't really seen any further near shoring, but we should see more, um, more diversification. And as I still have the microphone on this, uh, the, the opportunity and this resilience, and early on I was rather optimistic. I do want to 
mention the seafarers crisis because they are really the ones who are currently uh, they're the system is not sufficiently resilient there are so many seafarers currently on the ships who cannot go home or, or who are at home and are unemployed and cannot go back to the ship because they are because of the, they are not vaccinated the, there's no travel allowed for them they cannot reach the ship so they are they are stuck on the ships and that is something we must please not forget when we talk about the resilience of supply chains think of the people who work on the ships in those supply chains what what, what does the climate pathway look for maritime how does it look for maritime transport in general i i'm Sorry, could you repeat the question? How, how the climate pathway looks for maritime... Okay, the climate path, the, the decarbonization. Yeah, yeah. no, um, it's, it's the biggest challenge. The transition, the, the decarbonization is the biggest challenge in shipping for many, many decades, like going from sail to steam and from steam to, to oil. And uh, early on, we mentioned also the, the cargo composition, the modal shift. 40% of the cargo that is being transported by ships is actually energy, it's oil, gas, coal. So uh, I alluded to it earlier, I'm very much in favor of a multilateral solution like IMO. Um, shipping and air was not initially covered in the Paris Agreement because among other things it was said, hmm, it's international, we cannot assign it to the countries because Paris was very much assigning emissions to countries. Now. We have shown, we have in our Ankhtar Derivi of Maritime Transport statistics that show you can actually assign emissions to countries, to mm. the flag state, to the owner, to the trader. And, and in that direction, there are now more ways, be it market-based, call it levy, call it other ways, really to charge. And um, the IMO has this short-term measure, medium, long-term and in the long term, uh, if we combine it with the optimism about technology, if we combine it with ambitious mm -hmm. attitudes from the industry, um, yeah, shipping and maritime should play its part, of course. As I, yeah. the chart yeah. I showed earlier about the, the share of the, the modes, maritime is really by far the highest in terms of transport volume, but it is not the highest in terms of, um, of, of emissions. Yep. So there's one certain risk that if we make shipping too expensive or too difficult, that actually you then move to air transport and, and actually increase emissions. Yeah? We did a, a study on, uh, on the impact of recent IMO measures and we found fortunately for the shorter measures, this is not the case, <laughs> uh, that, that the increase in maritime costs would lead to more or more emissions by air. But that's definitely something to be kept in mind. So, so okay. we want to promote okay. shipping but still shipping has to play its part, of course, as well in the decarbonization. All right, um, I wanna talk, um, Nancy, about um, equitable access uh, to mobility. Uh, minority communities um, have, have been disproportionately affected uh, it's been, and that really has been highlighted by the pandemic, whether it's banking, healthcare, transportation that we're seeing. What, what needs to change? How, how, to what extent is this being taken into account by governments as they try and you know, get this action in place? Yeah, no, very important question, uh, Axel. And I would say that this whole dis discussion about decarbonization and the focus on the Paris, on meeting uh, the Paris climate targets is in a sense a risk because all the attention is about reducing CO2 emissions. While the objective of transport is fundamentally to achieve sustainable mobility. Mm. And sustainable mobility is indeed green mobility, so environmental friendly uh, mobility, but it's also equitable access, efficiency and safety. And these are the three goals that are embedded in the SDGs. And very often I see that in the discussions we are having increasingly in the transport community, I mean, probably because we're getting closer to COP26, we forget that at the end of the day, our objective, what we have to deliver is sustainable mobility. And in that context, of course, the objective of equitable access is an objective we have to achieve at par with the objective of reducing carbon emission. Um, now, from, uh, you know, when you think about global 
equity comes the question um, of, you know, how do you ensure that the solutions that are being designed for reducing carbon emissions, for instance, are also equitable and in a sense, uh, developmental friendly for countries also in the global north. And I think that one of the uh, key elements that we need to absolutely work on is to rebalance the discussion uh, between uh, the global north and the solutions that are being proposed by the global north, in particular to decarbonize, and the solutions that are adequate for countries in the global south. Yeah, and I and Claude, I I, I see you nodding here um, in, in agreement. I mean, we do come back to that fundamental question: whether we can deliver. You know, again to Nancy's point, whether we can deliver on sustainable mobility and hit the Paris goals you know, on time. I mean, what 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 is what is your view here? Well, and uh, I really like indeed what Nancy said. Uh, even if somebody would say we are on another direction, we are not. This is really a very important topic. We can speak about CO2. We forget also other emissions. That's an, even another topic. But we have to deliver transport. We are here by ITF transport. So let's uh, really uh, focus on transport we want to reach. It doesn't mean that we need to double or triple all the infrastructures, but we need to reach the goal with the transport. We need to change some habits. And if you look at the pandemic, the solution people found was to order um, goods at home with a small lorry. I saw by my neighbors five lorries per day arriving with a stupid small box. <laughs> I thought this is really crazy what is happening now about transport. And sometimes people say, you defend roads. You really, I live in Brussels. And I, if I want to go to the town center, believe me, I take the subway and my car stays here before my house. So yeah. we know exactly that there are solutions and I should go, I know, I should walk to Schumann because Schumann is only three kilometers from my home, to be very honest with you, that I'm getting old 67 years. So that means we need to focus on all possible solutions. And what Nancy said, and this is for me crucial, PIARC is working in the many, with many LMIC countries. Mm. What we think about road safety and fantastic machines, which are going to be automatic, they stop automatically, very nice. When will those vehicles arrive? In some countries, I will not put any names to be negative to anybody, but we need to think about accessibility. That is also in the report of ITF. Hmm. We talk about mobility and we talk about accessibility. Hmm. You said I am professor. That was the base of my course at the university. Don't forget both aspects. And sometimes they are contradictory. That's true. That is true. Yeah, but yeah. if we really work on those to two topics, we will reach the goals. Um, but but you know, understood. And but lo looking at bigger solutions in your in your space, though, is is um, is electrification, for example, with electric grid decarbonization, the the solution everyone is after for the future. I mean, is that the the holy grail, if you like? If I may answer, I gave already a short uh, answer before. It depends how you are electrificating. Yes. It depends where you are building and preparing the batteries. I hope you know what is happening now and from where they are coming and the children who build them. Let's not forget that the social aspect is crucial in you know, all those questions. Electricity, an example, Norway has 100% water, uh, sorry, energy based on water. Perfect. All the electric cars, they are number one for electric cars. Very good. And I'm not killing that solution. I just say, be careful. Where is the electricity produced? Allow me one joke. There are trottinets. How do you call it in English? Well, 
uh, electric. And so you, you push with your feet. Yeah. A short time ago, not far from my home, there were 10 of them being loaded by a, a machine with diesel. Really. <laughs> Crazy situation. It happened. Yeah. All right. Yeah. No, I, I again, understood. Um, um, Jan, I'm going to come back to you in a second. Nancy, just in terms of, you know, when we talk about electrification, when we talk about any of these big um, projects, um, uh, you know, the investment is clearly critical. And a question comes in from an audience member, how we ensure developments choose the right projects. What are the paybacks that banks are looking for? You know, the, the whole investment piece and, and, and what you get back at the end of the day. I mean, clearly it's critical. Is this communicated well enough? Is it thought through well enough? Um, so let me first come back on, on the point of electrification and I share very much the view uh, uh, from Claude on, on the concern about electrification, at least the importance of making sure that this whole uh, solution uh, that is being proposed now largely by countries in the global north is actually relevant and adequate and timely for countries in the global south. And I would say that probably not in some contexts. One should know that at least in, in some countries, 50% of the population do not even have access to electricity. Mm. So thinking that you can actually promote this as the way forward for addressing a global problem like climate change is certainly not uh, a realistic um, uh, thinking and option. I have also some, some concern I have to say about the fact, and I would, I, I would come back to the point of Jan on, on the importance of multilateral approach and the importance of thinking coordinated. I think we need for electrification a much better uh, or an approach to coordinate industrial policy. What we see is car manufacturer promoting electrical vehicle in the global north and yet promoting no other type of vehicle in the global south. Again, if we want to have a global uh, solution to the problem of climate change, we need to start thinking global coordination, in particular, for instance, on industrial policy. So that would be my first point. On the issue of choosing the right projects, um, I have, in a sense, addressed this question. What we need is to assess projects in the particular context of countries we are looking at. Promoting e-buses in countries where you don't have a stable electric grid does not make sense. It does not make sense to promote e-buses in countries where 90% of the electricity is produced from coal. So if this is the option that countries want to promote and consider at one point, this needs to be faced and done in coordination with progress, for instance, on the energy side. So it's actually quite complex, but we are more and more aware of this complexity and are now looking at promoting particular projects in view of the context in which those solutions are being considered and not as a once and for all or blueprint solution that applies to all countries. Yeah, and, and, and Jan, let me bring you in here. Um, you know, uh, Nancy referenced your, your point on cooperation and, and multilateralism. Um, you know, what, are, are governments thinking enough about that? Um, and indeed, are, is, is, is our governments together with business, together with the private sector, thinking enough about what works and what doesn't in particular regions? And on the back of that, I wonder what technology excites you most? Yeah, no, very good question. I think what, what industry needs is also predictability to invest. I mean, you, you buy a ship or a plane or, or it's used 25, 30 years. And Right now, investments may be withheld because a ship owner doesn't really quite know yet what should I invest to, because it's not quite clear yet what will be the technology or will be the energy supply in the ports and so on. 
So the earlier and clearer and global we have this picture, the more we get the right investment early on. And just to illustrate how important it is in freight transport, with the, once you have a little bit not enough supply and, and this very inelastic demand, freight rates go through the roof. Yeah? Uh, to get a container from Shanghai to South America, it, it used to be normal priced $1,000, $2,000. It even went down to $200 it went up to 9,000 recently. Why? There are just, at this moment, not quite enough empty containers around. That has to do with COVID, with waiting ships, and so on. So, and we had other freight rates that went through the roofs when there was not quite enough oil tankers around, or not quite enough LNG tankers, or earlier dry. So just to say, if the energy transition requires that more and different ships are built, and this is the case, this is really necessary. If ships go slower, we also need more ships. So, and one way to reduce emissions is to go slower, makes sense. But it only makes sense if you ensure that the additionally necessary ships are built. And if there's not enough certainty, they are not built. And then really for, for the small island development states, the, the least developed countries that are already paying more for the transport, that are further away, if for those countries, connectivity transport costs worsen further, that's not, so we have to keep this in mind. So the, the challenge is, yeah, we want to have an ambitious goal, we want to get there. But we also want to make sure that the weakest, the global south, you call it, don't pay unnecessarily more than, than others. So yeah, easier said than done. <laughs> get yeah. a clear picture as soon as possible. Um, look, I've got a, a wary eye on the time, um, but I, and I'm going to come back to all three of you with a couple of questions and, and, and maybe have a think about these now because I'm going to bring Yari back in, in very quickly. And, and those questions are, you know, it puts you on the spot a little bit, but who, who is doing this really well right now in terms of governments, uh, in terms of policy? Who's leading the charge, if you like, um, is, 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 is one of the questions. And, and the second is, you know, give, give me examples, because I, I, I sense a little bit of pessimism in this conversation, but give, give me examples. Of the, so two or three actions that you think or that you feel most positive about as, 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 as we move forward. And I'll, I'll come back to you in a second on that. But Yari, just bringing you back, you know, with a context question in the meantime, has the pandemic do you think made things easier uh, or, or harder um, for what we're trying to achieve here and what we're discussing here? Thank you, Axel. That's a pretty, pretty difficult and good question, to be honest. Question. A, a big question. question. Um, I think that both sides, I, I mean, as we've seen, there's been a lot of increasing car use because people are afraid of taking public transport for the safety security reasons for health reasons specifically, uh, even though at the same time, the public transport sector has done a huge amount of work in, in putting in place protocols and, and, and for safety of drive, for drivers and, and the users of, of, of system. So there are those certain negative impacts, but I think there is an opportunity to leverage some of the behavioral changes that we've seen during the pandemic. Uh, and some of the actions and, and concrete measures that have been put in place by cities, for example, by increasing bike lanes, increasing walking pedestrian lanes. And, and there are these changes for perhaps there's something that we can, we can um, take advantage of increased teleworking, so reducing the commuting, um, increasing video conferences as we're doing right now, even though I, I dearly miss our debate in Leipzig at the moment, but, uh, but we can do some of these things in meetings online and, and through video conferencing as well. So I would say the, the pandemic has enabled and, and provided us an opportunity. I think it's up to all the actors, both private and public sector, to now rethink that how we're going to reshape the mobility of the future as a result of this and which parts of these changes we want to keep and which which effects of the pandemic we need to uh, perhaps remove. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Yari. Um, Nancy, to, to my questions before, and, and, and again, bearing in mind what we just heard from Yari, is, is the, is the pandemic and, and the, the opportunities we, we draw from that enough of a catalyst to prompt the sort of action we need and that we're talking about today? Who's doing it well, do you think? And, and what else do you feel particularly positive about right now? Um, who, who is doing well? We, we certainly, what we see is, is definitely a race for finding solutions from, you know, from several countries. 
And I think what we hear on the World Bank side in terms of, of client countries, we certainly hear a lot of requests for support and assistance uh, to see how they can meet the climate targets, how can they meet the SDGs. So, so everybody's looking for, for answers, for ways to really get uh, to the ambition that we have set in the SDGs and the Paris Climate Agreement. Now, some countries are, of course, much more uh, advanced than others, but what I can see is certainly on the low income and, and middle income countryside, quite a lot of energy and interest to really get there. And I know on the high income side, OECD countries, that's what we heard here at ITF much, much as well. Now, in terms of who particularly is leading the change? I think we have several actors. Uh, I very much believe in the power of partnership and the power of coordination, as you probably have guessed. Uh, Claude started by saying it's not an, one organization that can lead that systemic changes. We need to, to, bring, to really bring resources, expertise, and knowledge together. We have started this uh, with the Sustainable Mobility for All platform. There are many other partnerships that are moving in this direction. And I think that this is the way out to really get the type of systemic changes that we need, that we pull resources, expertise, and knowledge together, uh, and then support countries with that knowledge. Countries are in need, and so we are there to actually support them. Okay, Nancy, thank you. And Claude, again, I, I, I saw you nodding there. Clearly, we're all in agreement on this 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 desperate need for for, for cooperation and coordination. Um, who do you think is doing it well? Well, <laughs> my answer is very easy. We have only 125 countries of the world member of PIAC. I can confirm you that they are all aware of what is happening even the smallest and uh, far from home here in a, in a wood or uh, in a lost part of the world. They are aware of it. Our goal as PIARC is exactly to exchange knowledge and reports about all what we could. We have set up a COVID-19 team on the leadership of Patrick Malejak, and you see his picture uh, is our secretary general. He has made that with partners, but also internal. The reports are on the website. It is an opportunity. If I sounded pessimist, please change it. I am an optimistic. I am sure even that uh, the, the pandemic is an opportunity to change the world and to have better transport in the future, but also better infrastructures, which, will, which we need. Hmm. The question is though, Claude, uh, will, will this happen quickly enough? Well, as I said, the infrastructure, you cannot replace the whole infrastructure in two days. The lifetime of an infrastructure is minimum 50 years, normally. And I am not talking about an asphalt layer, which is, of course, a little bit less, but you can change it. But we need, really, a view on long term, mm -hmm. in a time where you need very quick changes on short term. Jan, um, final comment from you. I mean, clearly, the context has changed uh, dramatically, you know, especially in, in your space, whether we talk about supply chains, whether we talk about, about maritime transport, and we've, we've talked about both. Where, where are you feeling particularly positive right now, Jan? Yeah, thanks. And you mentioned change. Uh, one of my favorite books is called What Have You Changed Your Mind About? By a, mm -hmm. a series called Edge. I really recommend it. So when I see how industry, organizations, governments have changed their mind over the last few years about the whole polluter pace principle, understanding it is not only increasing costs, prices, levies, but actually realizing that already today somebody else is paying for climate change. People in Bangladesh who are flooded, in Mali who don't have the crops, or even rich Swiss who don't have snow in their ski resorts. So somebody is already paying today understand, change your mind about charging for this, internalize externalities. And I'm optimistic, positive that I have seen a change in attitude that, that we are moving towards instruments in this direction. All right, Jan, thank you very much indeed. Look, I, I, I wanna wrap things up there. Um, we are at time, um, you know, we could go on for, for hours. Yeah, th this session was all about from advice to action, 
um, you know, we heard the advice from from the ITF uh, in in the report. You know, clearly the 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 context, the pandemic context, is 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 seen by most as an opportunity, especially by the optimists as an opportunity um, to, to 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 make some decisive action here uh, on the sustainable, equitable uh, mobility front. You know, it would be good if next time we meet, we can you know our, our title would 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 address what actions have been made and, and how we can build on those and, and, and what is working and what is what not working so well. Um, we've, we've jumped around a lot, but we've, I think we've covered uh, a, a lot of ground and I want to thank all of you for that. Um, and Nancy van Dijk from the World Bank, Claude van Ruten from Piak and Jan Hoffman from uh, Onktad, thank you to all of you. Thank you as well to those who sent in uh, questions. There's clearly a lot of discussion going on here, clearly a lot of debate, clearly a lot of heated debate, you know, especially on the infrastructure side, I would say. But uh, my thanks to all of you and thanks to Yari uh, as well for your uh, presentation uh, of the outlook. Uh, we hope to see you again very soon, hopefully next time uh, in Leipzig. Thank you all very much indeed. Thank you.